Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you. And uh, it was great to hear about empathy, because charities are where you find empathy. And for those of you who may not want to make your careers in data, I can assure you you have a great future if you work in the nonprofit sector, which is what I'm going to be talking about. So I want to talk a little bit about the most important economic topic of which you've never heard. So that's the uh, challenge that we're seeing today in the possible fight to the death between the charitable sector and the business sector. So, what am I talking about here? I want to ask you three questions. Since this is a program about your future, let's place this question about your future in some context. First, do you think that nonprofit, for-profit businesses and government will kill off charities in your lifetime? And if so, would you care? And if you do care about this subject, is there a way that you could help to avoid this fight to the death? So we have in our United States economic life three sectors. We have the for-profit sectors of business, which you've just been hearing about. It's sometimes um, also referred to um, as the for-profit sector, the private sector, but the business sector. And the thing about the business sector is that it sells goods and services to the public, and it makes profit, pays tax on the profit, and then distributes those profits out to the shareholders or the owners or uh, in capital gains and dividends. The second sector is the government sector, and that's where you find the federal, state, local governments and their agencies, and they're supported by taxes and fees. The third sector is the charity and nonprofit sector, also sometimes called civil society. And charities are a subset of this sector, and they include religious, educational, scientific organizations, poverty-fighting organizations, and those fighting poverty, excuse me, cruelty to children, women, the elderly, and animals. So we have these three sectors, and they have been our three sectors since we had the first charities law in the year 1601. So we have been working with these, and they've been relatively balanced for the past 400 years. So now we come into the 21st century, and we're seeing disruption. Part of it's due to technology, but something else is beginning to happen here, and we're beginning to see an imbalance where all three sectors are involved, but the business sector and the charity sector have come into special tension. Now, again, I just want you to remember the key differences. Businesses are earning income, paying taxes, and distributing their net profits. Charities are not able to uh, pay taxes because they're exempt. We don't want them to pay taxes. And they are not allowed to distribute. They have to plow their earnings, not sending it out to any kind of ownership. Uh, so they're not driven by owners. They're not directed by owners. They're for the public good. And nobody owns a charity. And so no part of their net earnings go out to anybody. So we've talked about the, the situation with charities and how we've had them for 400 years. We've talked about their key differences. And we've talked about the fact that things are changing now. I'm going to talk about three ways that things are changing. And they involve advertising, operations, and technology. So uh, when we were working on this project, Scott gave me the example that he went to buy a new water bottle. And so I'm sure he looked online for water bottles and compared the different op options in getting the water bottles. And he ended up buying the one that advertised to him that the water bottle proceeds would go to a charity or a part of the proceeds would go to a charity. That is very, very common 
with your generation, and because of technology and because of business practices changing, your generation is the very first one that is driven by the concept of what we call cause marketing. And so for-profit businesses are now using the halo effect of charities to advertise products to you. And like trained individuals, your generation is responding. In fact, 80% of the time, you look for a cause marketing situation to buy a product. So why isn't that a good thing? That sounds like a great thing, right? Well, it's become a very big business for sure, but what if those businesses are using this just to maximize their profits, and they aren't really doing what they say they're going to do. So let's just pick an example. After 9-11, the Steve Madden Shoe Company decided that they wanted to do something for charity. So they had a line of shoe that they created called The Bravest, and they advertised that these shoes would uh, have sale proceeds that would go to support the firefighters, the 9-11 firefighters who had fallen in New York City. And they sold over 35,000 pairs of these shoes, The Bravest. But when the New York Times went to the Steve Madden Shoe Company and asked them, about how much they had delivered to charity, what was the answer? Zero. This field is not particularly well regulated, and I think they may have been surprised to have somebody come and ask them. And so in the end, what was negotiated is that 10 cents on every dollar of profit would go not to the families of the fallen firefighters, but to New York City fire training. So all those shoes were sold, 35,000 pair, but none of the money went to the advertised recipient. And remember, it wasn't 10 cents on each dollar of proceeds, it was only 10 cents on the profit portion. Now, if you look at the marketing companies, and by the way, this is over a billion dollar a year business now, that cause marketing, that 10% of the profit piece is considered pretty generous. So I think the moral of that story is that when you think you're helping charity, your help at best may be very indirect. So let's talk about where you could have a more direct link to charity. So your contacts with charities. You were probably born in a not-for-profit hospital. You will likely someday be married by an official of a religious charitable organization. Perhaps you donated to Doctors Without Borders in order to help the Syrian migrants. Uh, someday you might work for a nonprofit documentary film producer like the Sundance Film Festival, or for a nonprofit theater like Joseph Papp's Public Theater in New York. You may not aspire to go to a university, uh, but if you do, would you prefer to go to a university? like Princeton University or the University of Michigan? Or do you aspire to go to a for-profit university, like the University of Phoenix? Do you have any perception of a quality difference between the nonprofit universities and the for-profit universities, which have to pay out their profit to shareholders and not necessarily put it right back into the mission enterprise? What if you're going to uh, uh, consider school for your children? You are all at a nonprofit school at Friends Academy, so you have a deep rooted connection to a nonprofit institution. What if you're going to uh, work for a hospital someday? Would you like to work for a hospital that has a charity care requirement, like North Shore LIJ or St. Francis Hospital? Or would you prefer or find yourself working at a for profit hospital? Would it be of any concern to you that that hospital has no obligation to do any charity care? So here, especially at a school like Friends Academy, where you're taught about values, uh, these are considerations that you might want to think about. So with these examples, I think that you can see that there's been a blurring of the lines between business and charities. So this is, of course, of great interest to government policymakers. 
Why? Because people in Congress and elsewhere are always eager to expand the tax base. What's a better way to expand the tax base than from having the tax-exempt entities, like charities, have to become taxpayers? So, do you think this is hypothetical? It's actually a real concern, and it is something that is just beginning to happen. So five months ago, on June 28, 2015, Judge Vito Bianco of the Tax Court of New Jersey revoked the real property tax exemption of Morristown Hospital, the community hospital in Morristown, New Jersey. And in doing so, Judge Bianco said, well, you know, the history of charity hospitals is that they began as medieval almshouses, you know, where the monks lay the infirm poor out on the floor and gave them some basic medical care. And now we have these very modern nonprofit hospitals. Yes, they're still providing medical care, but they're having to be sophisticated. So what does that mean? They buy sophisticated equipment. They pay sophisticated compensation. They have sophisticated structures. Yes, they still give charity care, but he decided that they were the functional equivalent of for-profit hospitals. And in reporting this, the Wall Street Journal said, this is the first time a judge has been willing to say a modern nonprofit hospital is not a charity. So the first time was five months ago, but this is coming. This is coming, and this is only the first of a long pipeline of cases. So what does that mean to you? Do you think that preserving the charitable sector and the values of the charitable sector is important? Well, why should you think that? What is there about preserving charity that might make it worthwhile? So, let's do a little history here. In 1830, the French government dispatched a young man uh, to go to the United States and to see what made democracy so successful in the United States where it hadn't been successful in other places. And that man, of course, was Alexis de Tocqueville, who wrote the book Democracy in America. And what was it about American democracy that so intrigued Alexis de Tocqueville? Well, it was his astonishment as at what he found. Oh, I'm having problems, sorry. Alexis de Tocqueville found what he called by the French name associations, which is actually translated into English as charities. So Americans of all ages, all conditions, all dispositions constantly form associations, charities. They have not only commercial and manufacturing companies, but associations of a thousand other kinds. And what was his conclusion? His conclusion was, well, I'm having this problem here, sorry. that wherever at the head of some new undertaking, you will see the, um, a man of rank in England and the government in France, in America, you're sure to find an association. So that's a critical finding for us, and it's been so important in our history that when we got tax laws, the exemptions for charities were hardwired into the tax laws. So the deduction for charitable giving and the tax exemptions are the oldest provisions in our internal revenue code. So we have to use or lose our civil society. And de Tocqueville's view has carried forward into the 21st century. And people are, a lot of people are writing about this challenge between the two sectors. Philanthropy Under Fire, a 2013 book by Howard Husack, says, totalitarian societies do not encourage or even permit the independent institutions of civil society. 
whether churches, private schools, or even block associations. And that's something we are certainly seeing around the world today as we're asking with all of these groups that are arising and attacking democratic countries, what is it different about these people? Well, if you look at those countries, you will find that none of them have a civil society like we do. The civil society that Howard Hussock says is what makes America and other democracies humane places to live. So, if you care about this, how can you make your voice heard on this subject? Well, one of the things you can do is you can investigate that cause marketing. It's a billion dollar a year business, it's not going away. But the Attorney General in New York State has posted a memo on his website so you can learn how to investigate whether your money is actually going to charity, and if so, how much. In addition, you can ramp up your contact with charities. And another thing you might want to do is actually engage with charities directly in your career. Now, how might you want to do that, and what might that do? Well, it might make you serve as an example to other people that profits aren't everything that sometime having a passion in life and helping others free because they can't afford your product or your service is also a very rewarding personal thing to do. So, I want to mention to you the example of Sal Khan. Sal Khan is an individual whose niece, Nadia, was having real difficulty with sixth grade math and he promised her that he would help her with her math problems. But because they lived in different states, he wasn't sure how to do that. So he started posting videos for her on YouTube. Now that's a great use of that technology, and because those are available to all, and they're free, it meant that a lot of other people, including Bill Gates, started using the homework videos and the math videos for learning. And that made Sal Khan realize that he could do something. He quit his hedge fund job, and he founded Khan Academy. And Khan Academy promotes free online education for all. And when he did that, he had to make a critical choice. Was he going to create Khan Academy as a for-profit business with stockholders and distributions, IPO, those kinds of things? Or was he going to create Khan Academy as an educational nonprofit? And you probably know the answer of what he chose. He chose to operate as an educational charity. He followed his passion. And he said, I'm just not in it for the money, and I want to help people. So if you're the next Sal Khan, how will you answer this question? Thank you.